It's all good. Right. All yeah, right. I, let's I had to step away real briefly. Uh, we had just, we just got off from talking about uh, the kids and the grandson. I told you he's an element by himself. You know, he crashed the last. I, well, you I were so amazing. It. We loved it. I loved hearing his it, little voice. Well, I'm like, it's so real. That is authentic. <laughs> and he was, he was gearing up to come crash again. <laughs> get him to the get him to Marion but uh yeah he he was sitting here and walked I heard something and I kind of looked peeped around and looked and I saw him and he's looking at me and he he has this thing like the other day I went somewhere and I came back and everybody was downstairs and he was in my office and he was just pecking away on the uh <laughs> board and you know making hand gestures like I do when I'm doing videos and I said what are you doing in my office he said I'm working oh He's so, going to be quite the little leader. Yeah, he he's definitely going to be that. He's not a follower at all. So you're he, you're that's so awesome. him away. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, so I saw him already planning his interest. He, he will <laughs> definitely bust in on a, a session. I love it. But your patience. I remember I commented on that before. You were so patient with him. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And I now tell my team members whose kids are you know, crashing. I'm like, it's okay. Let's say hello. They're your marketing assistants. Okay. Because <laughs> right. it's a wonderful thing. And I love your, you said patience. And that's so incredibly important. Yeah. We were talking about it, Dr. Wallace, how all your remarks were like about that, having grace and patience. And you were actually doing it during the session. We, we were all living involved. it. That's right. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and and it's funny how my gr great grandmother would always tell me, "Be careful how you talk, because life will present the opportunity." Mm. And uh, and I find that, you know, even when it comes to like what we're going to talk about today, you know, you got to be careful when you're this guy who writes stuff that people read, right? Because you write it, and people tend to develop their own idea of who you mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. So. When you say, okay, this is what you do in marriage, they go, he's a marriage expert. He has a perfect marriage. Nothing goes wrong. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this is how you get through rough patches because I haven't met anybody who hasn't had rough patches, uh, who hasn't had difficulty. It's not about the fact that I don't, but you got to be careful mm -hmm. about that. But, you know, and I, every time, you know, uh, things pop up, I'm like, mama told me about there will be days like this. You know, hey, you have to sit up and be prepared. Anything worth having requires a lot of energy, effort, work, and commitment. I haven't, I haven't obtained anything that I see or consider of value that it just fell in my lap. Absolutely. Right. So true. And you, I saw you were born in the 60s. I was, too. I was born in 1966. And at the end of the day, there's a different level of work ethic that mm. comes, I think, with our generation. My 18-year-old wants the results, wants to be a rap star, wants this, wants that, wants that, but he's not willing to put in the work. At least I haven't seen it yet. You know, we'll see. Marion and I talk about this a lot. And, if, you know, at one point you start thinking, what did I do? Correct. Wrong, that this is going on, and then Marion- the opposite points, of who we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Marion points out the fact, baby, it's not just our kids. Right. It's a generation of kids who want the promise without the process. They want the result yes. without the work. And it's That's not right. that we aren't, because I mean, if you look at this house, Marion is an extremely hard worker. I'm up every day. I mean, when I came home from my heart attack, I'm at the computer the next day and Marion's about to lose her mind. That's I just can't how believe you had a heart attack. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, I had five last March. Oh my God. Yeah, so, uh, and, uh, you know, but, you know, we're working on it. Uh, I'm doing something different. You mentioned on the phone call about working out. That has to become a priority for me. Something Absolutely. that I had to finally sit up and realize I couldn't do at my convenience. You know, because there's right. so much that is demanded of you. You start, and I tell people all the time, my clients, you have to prioritize your have to's. Because Absolutely. the things you have to do are the things that are only, only, are only the only things that are guaranteed to get done. Everything Absolutely. else is on standby. 
Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, a thousand kid, percent agree. You know, I mean, Kelly like, Chapman I, just joined us all. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Oh, uh, we haven't opened up everybody. We'll pull them in one second. So, Dr. Wallace, since we're facilitating via video, I just want to uh, remind you that the chat will be open if you would like us to address anything via the chat or read any questions that we receive. We're happy to do that. Yep. And yeah. I will be looking at that as well, Angela, and we'll try to interject okay, uh, from time to time. That, that's great. Um, yeah, what, I'm, what, what my plan was is I wanted to give as much attention to the things that were highlighted uh, on this, but with it being such a monumental uh, conversation, what I decided I was going to do is I was going to touch on the topics that Kelly had put in front of me um, as succinctly as I can and leave more time for questions so we can get the questions that are going while we're talking. And if you want to just say, hey, you know, while I'm talking, hey, Dr. Wallace, so-and-so said, that's fine. I, I'm, I, I'll pick back up where I left off after the thing. We want people to be involved. We want them to know they matter. And th it's about educating people. And so um, I'm, I'm making the chat a part of the process. Absolutely. So Kelly, it is 9.01. Can, yeah. I go? Can I admit people now? Yes, please. Okay, we're ready to go. Let them in. Morning, Kelly Chapman. We'll get started. Good morning and welcome to our weekly parent call for the Sunrise Project. As always, I am so happy you're here, particularly on this first Sunday in February, where this whole month we'll be talking and focusing on issues of love and relationships, both with our partners and our loved ones. Um, it's the first Sunday, there's a big football game later today um, in about nine hours, but we all took a moment to be here with one another, to take time for ourselves, which is so, so critically important. And as always, I hope that you find a moment of solace and peace with one another as we share and learn in a safe space that's filled with love, compassion, and a desire to heal our families and ourselves. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Our survey results that we got back over the last several weeks have indicated that some of our Sunrise parents seek ways to foster and enhance the love relationships with our spouses or with our partners. Sometimes being a parent or a caregiver, as we know, to a mentally ill or addicted person can, can cause extra strain on the love relationship in our households. And for single parents, it can be even more daunting. So this morning, Dr. Wallace is going to be with us to talk about love and to talk about building those relationships despite the challenges and despite the obstacles that we all face. Dr. Rick Wallace has been with us before to share his incredible wisdom. For those of you who may not have been here to hear him before, he is the founder, CEO, and chief life mastery strategist at the Visionetics Institute. He created the Visionetics concept for optimal personal development based on nearly three decades of academic study, research, and experience in the areas of behavioral psychology, neuroscience, personal development, metaphysics, quantum physics, neuro-linguistic programming, and spirituality. He is one of the leading minds in the area of personal change, achieving an exceptional rate of success with his clients. Dr. Wallace has written and published 22 books um, and is just an incredible individual that helps raise the level of performance of people in every, areas of, every area of life, including finance, marriage, business, parenting, and more. And he has a beautiful wife, Marion, and they have 13 children, aging, uh, ranging in age from 35 to six, as well as a three-year-old grandson who graced us with his presence last time and hopefully we'll get to hear from him again this morning. 
He is super busy and he lives in Houston, Texas, where it is very early this morning. And I'm delighted to have Dr. Willis back, Dr. Wallace back with us this morning to speak on the restoration of family and building love in our relationships. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Wallace. Thank you so much for being here. First of all, thank you for having me. Uh, no matter how many times I hear my bio read, I'm going like, who are they talking about? Uh, you know, uh, I've never really seen myself. I have no problem in seeing myself as successful, but uh, when I hear bios like that, I'm going like, wow, who is this dude? But uh, it's a combination of years of just commitment. We talked about that. I tell people all the time, it's good to have a high IQ. It's good to be well read. It's good to know people. But at the end of the day, your, your story is going to be written and completed by the amount of commitment you have to doing something. So when people ask me, how did you get all that done? I just don't know how to quit. It's not in my vocabulary. So I keep going until I do it. Uh, and so to hear that spoken at the age of 53, I'll be 54 this year, uh, to hear that spoken um, or read is just a reminder uh, that I've been I've been committed to doing some things. Um, I'm going to try to be as succinct as I possibly can in talking about this because I want to open the floor up to questions. Everybody feel free to enter the questions in the chat or chime in uh, once the floor is open. Um, there's so much to talk about. One, if, if anyone has followed me uh, in the work that I do in the community, uh, they know the rebuilding of the Black family is at the top of the list for me. Uh, I see life in the form of institutions. The individual is within themselves an institution. You have the ability to set your standards, your goal, your values, your interests, your principles, uh, the character by which you will govern yourself based on those principles and the integrity, which is the strength of that character. But when you start to move into the next institution, which to me is the most powerful, which is marriage, you bring two individuals together with like-mindedness not two people who think alike on every occasion, but two people who are headed in the same direction, who want the same, who, who believe things should be done in a certain way. And they come together and they form this institution. It is within the institution of family, marriage that the third institution, family, is birth. Now, within the institution of family, that's where we teach our children their values, interests, and principles that govern their lives. It is where we inculcate into their mind and in their psyche how they care of themselves, who they are, most importantly, how they should view themselves in the world, how capable they are. All of these things happen before the age of five, believe it or not. And so, at, you know, up until five, a kid's brain is functioning, uh, brain waves are functioning in a state of theta almost constantly, meaning they're absorbing everything. And they are taking that information and they are determining and developing paradigms how they see, the, see themselves in the world and how they'll function in the world, what they're capable of, what they're not capable of, what's right, what's wrong, all of these different things. Well, some of the things we find ourselves struggling with in the black community as adults, and we are trying to hammer it home to uh, those who don't know, those of us who know are trying to hammer it home to those who don't know, and we, uh, we become frustrated, is because we're trying to teach them things in an adult mind that has already had uh, that, that has already developed hardwired paradigms on how things are done, we're trying to inculcate into their mind an entirely different concept than they're used to. And it's hard. It's hard to rewire. You can do it. I, that's what I do. I work with people in rewiring. But, but it takes constant, consistent to go from thinking one way to thinking another way, because basically your thoughts are the seeds of your destiny. What you think will produce your reality, period. But the way that it should be done is as parents. Now, we live in a world where we know that the divorce rate on, on, on any, any, in any study is somewhere hovering around 48 to 52%. And normally African-Americans uh, have the worst numbers. And there are a lot of variables that go into that. And for many of us, there's a large segment of single parents, predominantly women. Uh, that are forced to take on roles that they're not equipped and designed to take on. Uh, there's an external pressure for women to be everything. You know, the, you know, pressure to, 
to see equality as being the same. So instead of saying, okay, I deserve opportunity equally, I want to do everything. Well, just on the most general level, you can't do everything that a man can do. And a man can't do everything you can do. And there's a reason for that. There's a design universal reason that God created that makes us need each other. But we are being constantly bombarded with data that says we don't. And we pointed at each other. So now what we have is a broken family. We've gone from 1960 where 75% of our children were born in the uh, two parent households to now where that number is completely flipped, where 75% of children are in single parent households or reconstructed households. And so there's a problem with that. And at the core of it, we have to understand love. And we're in the month of February, Black History Month, but also there's this little day right in the middle of it, 14th, Valentine's Day. Everybody gets excited about it. Uh, I use it as a time to kind of anchor what I've hopefully done all year. And that's to sh uh, in some way show uh, my wife that I care and I love her. Um, sometimes I do a good job of it. Sometimes I don't. Uh, it's the reality of it. It's the thing that you have to be aware of as a person to have a good relationship is that you can see yourself in the light of another person. And it's not easy because we are by nature individual. But in essence, when I look at this, I see, okay, we've got children with mental health issues. We've got children. Uh, we have a rising number of children being uh, developing uh, autism. Uh, I, got, I have a whole little spectrum of parents I deal with, with just that one challenge, something that wasn't as prominent just 10 years ago. So that's climbing. You've got um, learning disabilities so they will tell us about our kids. You've got the disproportionality in which young black males are being referred into special education. You've got all that. But at some point, you got to still try to maintain your relationship with your spouse. And having situations where your child is struggling with an addiction, with learning disabilities, with mental health issues, there's a level of pressure put on that marriage that has, in many cases, destroyed it. Um, there's a lot of uh, work that has been done in the area of parents who have lost kids tragically. And the number of divorces that come out of that is astronomical, but the work hasn't really been done in parents who are dealing with children with challenges. Uh, not in the way that they've put in the work to find out okay, that information, but I can tell you from what I have been able to gather, it's a problem. And so how do we deal with that? How do we deal with something important? Because you got to understand this institution of marriage is the core foundation of how we live from everything to how we see and deal with God, to how we see and deal with our challenges, to how we teach our children to do the same when they become adults is going to be based on how we create this environment in which we call marriage because everything is birthed out of it. And so what does that mean? Well, I think one of the problems is I think that over the last 600 years or so, in an increasing manner, we've over romanticized it. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's about romance. It's about, oh, my God, my heart beats so fast when they walk in the room. And traditionally, that wasn't what marriage was about. Marriage was about two people who have the same values coming from families who basically have the same background who have like minds coming together and perpetuating the value system of the forefathers or the ancestors or the parents and ensuring that what the parents have instilled in them carries on to the next generation. Now that means wealth financially, but also intellectually, emotionally, and socially. And in, in that instance, being well-rounded. Uh, but what it has become is how I feel about you. And anybody that thinks they're going to enter a long term relationship with someone where they're going to be with someone 30 or 40 years and they're going to feel like they love them to death every day. Uh, well, that explains the divorce rate, because many of the divorces, while it shows that finance is the, at the top of the list, even that is a failed expectation. Everything that surrounds divorce is about expectation. What do you expect from your marriage? What do you expect from your mate? What do you expect from your partner? What do you expect to give and receive? And because we don't communicate that in the beginning, because we aren't aware of the most important element of marriage, which is covenant, 
we tend, and then they made this thing in 19, I think it's kind of hit roughly in the early 1970s, where you no longer had to have a valid reason to get a divorce. You could just state irreconcilable differences. Now divorces became by, I'm just tired. I'm tired. I don't want to do it no more. I'm moving on. It's not about responsibility of obligation. And see, I was always taught. And my grand, my great grandfather, who reared me, he's my adopted father. So my grandmother, in in legal terms, is my sister because her dad raised me, and and, and adopted me. And I always teased her about that. And I told my mom, I'm your uncle. Don't talk. Don't don't, don't you know? So, but. He had a second grade education because he had to leave school in the second grade and go out and help his dad in the fields, who was a sharecropper. But he told me, he said, you got to see marriage like a triangle. He says, on the bottom right is you, on the bottom left is your wife, and at the top is God. When you marry, you make a covenant, not only with that person on the side, but the person at the top, which is God. And there's nothing that God values more than covenant. Now, this isn't, just, this isn't a religious thing. This is a God thing. Whatever way you see God is your way of seeing God. But I guarantee you, if you have a relationship with God and your faith, whatever that faith is, I guarantee you, you're going to see a consistency in how he deals with covenant. In, in Christianity, you've got two major covenants, the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, and the New Testament, which is the New Covenant. But within each of those are all these other covenants. And God deals with the breaking of covenants pretty extensively and extremely. So then... When I'm looking at something in my marriage, I'm not just looking at my marriage, I'm looking at what I told God I would do in that sense. Because when you say uh, in sickness and health and richness and in poor, uh, in, in, you know, in good or bad to death do you part, that's like a major statement. And I don't think many people are thinking about it because me at the wedding time, what I found out most people put more energy in their wedding than they do their marriage. And so in essence, what you get is a lot of hype that your marriage can't possibly live up to. So now you got these expectations because you hyped the marriage during the wedding and during the, and do, do, during the courting process and you didn't talk to one another. You didn't say, okay, this is how I feel about this and this, I'm pretty strongly uh, anchored in this. How do you feel about it? But now that you've made this covenant, you've got to figure it out. And outside of certain things, I have no tolerance for abuse physically or emotionally or verbally. Uh, I don't ask anybody to tell anybody they have to deal with it more than once. Somebody that loves you should know how to treat you. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they're always going to do things right. Doesn't mean that they can't have a, a bad day or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. There are certain things you should never hear from your spouse. Your spouse should definitely never put their hands on you, male or female. And outside of that, then you start saying, okay, now, again, if you got a person in the, in the, uh, in your marriage and they're killing you financially and it's irresponsible decision after irresponsible decision, and it's sinking the family. Okay. To me, that's abuse. So again, you, you, you but that's something you at least try to work out initially. You don't just sit up and say, okay, I've been with him a month and he, he, he stays down there doing this, this, and this, and this. I can't deal with his fishing addiction, whatever it is. He's spending $500 a week on fishing, whatever. Talk to him and try to work it out. If it doesn't change, then you might have to do something. But all the other little nuance and things that, 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 that tend to get under our skin and make us, you know what? I, I'm done. That, that irreconcilable thing has put us in a position where we don't have to answer to God about why we're walking away. At the core, that's what has to hold you. It has to be something in your life bigger than you to keep you in situations. And that's not just marriage. That's anything that you desire to do that is of any significance. You're going to run into difficulty. You want to build a business. I guarantee you, you're going to run into difficulty. You want to start building wealth. You're going to run into difficulty. You're going to have setbacks. And if when it gets tough, you bail, you'll never get there. You have to have something that anchors you. Your why has to be bigger than your struggle or you're going to always fold. So in essence, what is bigger than anything? I chose God. God to me is bigger than anything. He's bigger than any amount of books I can read or write. 
is bigger than any problem I've ever run into, has the answer to every problem I've ever ran into. And my thing is, if I've got this relationship with God and God has all the answers and God doesn't withhold any of them, I'm actually never in a situation I can't overcome. The question is, am I willing to put in the work? Am I committed enough? Am I willing to go the distance? That's at the end of the day going to be the answer. Now, how do we deal with this? We have to learn to get outside of ourselves. Marriage is the one place. Matter of fact, uh, when I was writing my first book on marriage, uh, Kelly uh, mentioned uh, that uh, merging, and I think it's even in the uh, the uh, the uh, printout that went out that the book Merging Souls, um, I sort of changed the title after after a while. It's still Merging Souls, but now it's Hope, uh, Healing, and Restoration in Modern Marriage. But that's the follow-up to When Your House Is Not a Whole, a book, uh, When Your House Is Not a Home. I wrote that years ago. I think it's my fourth book. And doing the research in that and looking at all those things, and it's just something that comes out of this thing called marriage that you have to be committed to it. You have to see something bigger than yourself in it. You have to be willing to trust and go the distance. And so when I look at my marriage, the first thing I see is God. The second thing I see is a need to get outside of myself. In doing the research for that book, I read a book called Sacred Marriage by a guy by the name of Gary Thomas. Uh, and on the cover of the book, it says, what if God's intent for marriage wasn't so much to make you happy as it was to make you holy? Mm. What if marriage was the greatest challenge you were ever going to face? And through it, you would build the integrity to be everything else you could be. What if God created marriage to form, refine, and shape you. It wasn't this happy little landing place where everything that was broken gets fixed automatically. What if you really needed to be kind of together before you got there? And it was the finally, final testing and building ground. It's your reward for being true to your calling. And then you get there. You know, uh, 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 Proverbs tells us that uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and attains favor from the Lord, uh, from God. And so what if that's the final place that you land and through that you do all the rest of your work? Mm -hmm. What if the spirit for men, I don't know how, I know I see at least one man, uh, looks like he's on his way. What if for men, the, the, the spiritual womb of your wife was recognized and acknowledged as the birthing place of your vision? What if for your for, for the women, the your your husband became the covering of everything that you needed, provision, protection, spiritual enforcement, and inspiration, speaking into your life, even when you can't see it. And that covering thing, when you go to everybody misuses this verse, Ephesians chapter five, when it says, when they love that one little piece, you know, why submit to your husband, but they don't read the whole thing. And a great deal of when your house is not a home comes from Ephesians. And it, it, it misses the whole part where it says, husbands, you ought to love your wife. But then the greatest part of the instruction is to the husband, not to the wife. It tells the wife, submit to your husband as, as unto Christ, but it tells the, the husband to love the wife as Christ loved the church. So in order for her to come into you and submit, it's not the type of submission, first of all, that we think. It's a saying, I'm going to rest under your covering. I'm going to tr trust you to be the provision and protection I need you to be, even in the difficult moments, in the challenging moments. Anybody can do what's right when everything's going good. That's not where your character is tested. Your character is tested when everything around you seems to be crazy and all you can see, I'm obligated to God. Not in a bad way, in a wonderful way. The best thing I could be obligated to is this covenant to my wife before God and that alone tells me I have what it takes. But if you go through and you exegete that scripture, when it says nourish, there's, that, there's a Greek word that means to literally brood over as a hen broods over her, 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 her chicklings. So this thing, this idea that only women are nourishing is not, is not divine. 
That's that's a, a perception man had because the husband has to nourish and protect and cover and brood over his wife. Mm -hmm. That that part of it we miss. And so the first the, the thing that I want to leave with people is marriage is about sacrifice. But I don't like to call it sacrifice because that's such a negative connotation associated with the word sacrifice. Sacrifice to the average person means I'm giving up so much to make this happen. To me, if I can be the husband my wife wants and needs me to be and God expects me to be, what I'm giving to do it is small. It's not easy because it pull, it constantly pulls you out of yourself. It constantly forces you to see what someone else needs before you see what you need. It constantly makes you do the little small things. But you know, I know Valentine's Day is about romance, but the, there are 364 other days in the year that your marriage needs you to be functional. Mm -hmm. And so in that, how are you functioning? Are you hearing? And I'll tell you, it's not easy to hear. Nobody wants to hear what they need to improve. We live in a world where as long as somebody's praising you, it's all good when they start telling you what you need to do. Wait, what you mean? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hear it, but you got to want to hear it because literally, even in a complaint, your spouse is telling you how to be better. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. We want the romance. I want to give you, you know, I want, I want you to have romance in your life. You know, that's something that I am really going to work on in 20 21 is the romance side of things, the, the unexpected things. You know, yeah, I bring the occasional flowers home and I always make sure it's when I'm not in trouble. You know, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I don't do the I'm sorry flower thing. I, I like thinking, man, I'm just riding and I'm thinking, I'm gonna take her flowers today. I try to do that. I need to do that more frequently, but there's so much more that I can do to get out. I'm a very uh regimented person so you can pretty much log my day on what i'm doing and i want to get out of that because i think it excites her mm -hmm. and yeah it's gonna be uncomfortable because I, I i'm i'm like i said i'll be 54 this year i'm i'm, I'm good with just making sure what i need it done is done and chilling mm -hmm. but that's not what she needs from me right. and what i can tell you is when you truly love somebody you find joy in their happiness and so I can be okay with doing something I may not really, you know, care to do. It ain't like I don't like doing it. It's just, I don't have to, you know? And one of the things, simple things is traveling. Up until 40, I freaking traveled so much. I mean, that wasn't a month for like 10 years that every week I was gone somewhere. It's what I did for one reason or another. So now I don't have to get on a plane ever, ever, ever again in my life. But that's not where she's at. She wants to go places and do things. And she has a right to want those things. I mean, there's a whole world out there to see. She's seen some of it, but she wants to see more of it. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. Just, just trying to be a better person. And I think that when a person sees your effort and that you're not dismissing them, that is important. Now, there's a question that popped up. Yeah. Uh, two things that popped up. One says, how do you get the feelings of love to come back after being at war in your own home? I think we go back to the source, God. I think that when you're at war in your home, God's not in that. So then you've got to figure out how that came about. What external forces got into your marriage that didn't belong there? Because I guarantee you, when your focus is God and a heightened elevation, when you're living your life with the mindset of divine and functioning in your calling and in your purpose and your marriage has the right priority, yes, you're gonna have bumpy roads, but when you say you're at war, that means two sides are at odds. And rather than confront and deal with them, there's no one, 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 um, fix 
uh, no panacea for that because the cause is important. Seek counseling, get spiritual counseling if at all possible. And in the counseling, give each other permission to be honest. And in the counseling, open up about uh, what led to and all these different feelings of distance and be honest about it. Uh, if at all possible, try to seek counseling before it gets that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the things we do, we talk about mental health and health, and this is kind of a branch out from the mental health individual thing, but even on the individual level, we have such a view of getting help. It's such a stigma attached to it that we'll little, literally sink in our own funk to the point of, you know, this deputy uh, that killed himself because he was just so outdone with racism and policing that happened last week. He needed help, but probably told no one. I can tell you, I don't care how good you think you are, you need somebody you can talk to. Yes, you need uh, to be able to talk to God. That's first and foremost. But if you have a good relationship with God, then you need, as a man, you need to have at least one man that has a good relationship with God that you can talk to. Um, as a woman, you need that same thing, preferably somebody who's married. Uh, I, I don't talk to, I have a very close friend who's not married and I don't discuss my marriage at all with him. Um, there's only one person I've talked to my marriage about since I've been married and he's a minister. He's a close friend and also just happens to be related to my wife. So he has a motive to make sure I'm on my game because that's his family but he's also can understand some of the things I'm going through and he's honest. Mm -hmm. You need somebody that's going to be honest with you because you get up in your feelings and everything is everybody else's fault. And so he's not going to let me play that game. And you need that. You need somebody, but you also need somebody to kind of help you unravel your thoughts because once you take on a defensive approach to life in any area, it's gonna be hard to hear someone else's opinion because you see them as the enemy. And in order to stop seeing your spouse as the enemy, you need to seek God. And that may have to happen through uh, an intervention or a mediation. Um, I mean, now the second one is something that kind of hits home. How do you regain attraction? I'm always in love with my, I think my wife is just the most gorgeous person in the world but you can let yourself go. And I'm talking about me being unhealthy. And so the first thing about attraction is you have to know what your spouse is attracted to and you need to let your spouse know what you're attracted to. And there's a different level though. There's a different level with me. I'm attracted to the God in my wife. And, I, and those who know me know I'm not a religious person. I'm well studied. One of my doctors, I have two, one is in theology. And I stay very close to God, but I've just learned to see him in so many different ways that you can't box him with me. You can't put him in a box and say, this is, you know, no. Too much that has been done on my level is done with beyond expectation. But um, the thing is, I see the God in my wife. Even when we're not on the same page, I see the God in my wife. That's what settles me. When there's discord, I just look past what I'm seeing in person and I see the God in my wife. And that right there, if God can't attract you, then start searching inside. Deal with what's inside, what's there. And you got to understand, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut it down after this. You got to understand this. We live in a world where social media drives everything. Image, attraction, the standard of beauty, the standard of what is expected, how something's supposed to be going. Everybody's trying to live a life that's being presented by someone else on social media and finding that it's not attainable and that what you're actually watching is an experience that has been created and isn't necessarily being lived. I tell people all the time, uh, whether I'm talking about growing a business, that I've gotten my butt kicked in business. I've had some unbelievable successes, but I've had some lows. 
when it comes to marriage, I am happily married but it doesn't come without challenges. There's no perfect anything in this world. You're building something. You're trying to get excellence out of it, but perfection is something that you strive for, but you should never be judging based on it. So look at your mate and love your mate first through God. A lot of the things that you're dealing with at that point will go. When you got to love your mate through God, God filters out the selfishness. When you have to love your mate through God, God filters out the selfishness. But if you're trying to deal with your mate solely based on what you're seeing at the moment, it can be frustrating. You're two different people. I mean, distinctly different as a species. Men and women are not the same. So you've got to understand that. And, you, the, and the thing is, if all that you have is the physical attraction, you got a problem anyway. There's got to be something deeper. And the thing is, Look for the things that go beyond the surface, the things that time won't change, the things that situations won't change. That's the thing. Like I said, when I see my wife, the first thing I see is God. So, you know, there are times when, you know, I may be instinctively doing or saying something, but it doesn't take long for me to sit back and say, oh, would God be happy with what I just did? That was selfish. That was you in your ego. Will God be happy with that? Is that the is that why he entrusted her with you? Mm. And I have to ask myself, is that why God? And absolutely not. That's not why God entrusted with me. God entrusted me with her because he knew I was capable of being what she needed and that I would grow into whatever was needed and that I would trust God to be what I needed as a source you know, we can become so intellectual that we don't see the spiritual. And I don't mean mystically. I mean, just the connectivity and the energy that is emitted from understanding your relationship with God provides the power, the vibration, the elevation, all of these things that you have talked about on many different levels. It's all real. It's all a part of God's plan, but at the ultimate base of it is faith. Do you believe like you really say you believe, or are you just saying you believe because it's what you're supposed to say? So I'm going to stop there. I could go on all day about this thing because it's something I'm extremely passionate about. But I want to open up and answer other questions. Yeah. Uh, or if I didn't give enough clarity to the two questions that were in the uh, chat, uh, feel free to chime in and ask more pointed questions. I, I'm pretty transparent. Uh, and it's easy to do that when you don't paint yourself as being perfect. That's great. It was super helpful. Everything you said, I think the piece about sacrifice so incredibly important and i think for me and please um if anyone has a comment and you're on the phone hit star six to come off of mute please feel free um or you can put a note in the chat either one i think for me the question is how do you deal with if you're in so much trauma yourself dealing with the individual that um has the challenges and there's so much focus on trying to get self-care you know trying to get some sleep trying to find some time for myself, trying to get my exercise in, et cetera. There is very little time left for mm -hmm. focusing on anybody else outside of just, even just find a little bit of time for me. So how do you do that? Like find the time to make sure that we're focused on our own preservation first, quite honestly, I'm being very honest. Yeah. How do you find time for your spouse or another person? Priority. Uh, you and I talked about this when we were talking about working out on, uh, on the uh, phone call before we, we got on. Uh, you have to prioritize. I, I don't think you get to be to your 30s. I think at 20, everything just kind of flies by. I don't think you get to your 30s without realizing that you have enough going on in your life that could fill your day every day for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And it's no way that you're going to get it all done. What you have to understand is you have to find the four to five things that you are going to prioritize. And what we tend to do without even knowing it mm. is put our marriage on the back burner because we think it'll be there. We don't see it as something we have to prioritize. Right. Uh, and there are other things we do. Here's what I can tell you. If it's not in the top four or five, it may get done. It may not. 
because your day is going to dictate how you pro- based on how you prioritize. Mm-hmm. And I told you my example was I hadn't prioritized my fitness mm-hmm. and it had led to some serious health health situations. And so I had to, act, it, you know, it could no longer be when I get to the gym, I get to the gym because I know me when I sit down and these fires start popping up, I'm going to start dealing with the fires because they are a priority. Well, I had to realize number one priority based on the way God orders things is my marriage. Mm. So it's not after I do, after I do this, it's I'm going to do this. And so what it led to is like, for the first time, you know, I started this a few weeks ago. Sundays used to be my start of the weekday. And when I get off of, off of this call, I'll pretty much be done. I might do a few things, but that whole, my whole Sundays, I'm working. No family time. Wow. Yeah. You know, and uh, Saturdays, I took all of my clients off my schedule for Saturday. I don't do any clients unless it's an emergency or a crisis. I don't do any Saturdays, family time. And in that family time, wife time comes first. Mm. And it was just simple, that simple. You have to prioritize it. And here's what happens that's so, so special and we don't really understand, unless you can really understand how the mind functions mm. on a very distinct and specific level, it's hard to understand how this works. You just know it works. And it's okay to just know it works. You don't have to know how, but when you know how you understand it, the moment I prioritized my wife, I hurt her more. When it went from, you know, the whole conglomerate, we're a family. Uh, this is, you know, our, our home, our dwelling, and you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. You doing what you're doing. I'm encouraging you in your business. But what am I doing about our marriage? You know, you hear, my wife hears from me every day on how awesome she is and what she does. But how often does she hear, I love the way you're keeping the house together. Let's go sit down and talk. Let's go calm down. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. And on a personal level. And, but once I decided I'm prioritizing her, I start to hear her. Mm -hmm. And nothing is more powerful in a relationship than being heard. It shows you matter. So at the at the core of it, you have to prioritize the things that are important to you based on the level of importance. It's a condemnation to us when society has dictated how we are dealing with our most prized blessings. Mm. I got to go do this. I got to. Everybody's running to secure the bag. Everybody's running to hold down their personal passions, but who's serving their marriage? He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Then there are all these other verses that talk about the interactions between the husband and the wife. Is that the life I'm living? Mm -hmm. Or am I taking that for granted? Mm. And... If you're honest with yourself, both of us are probably sunk into something. And it's kind of this idea that marriage is like this thing where it's, you know, we married. It'll be, no, if you don't watch it, we won't be married. Because for every time that you don't prioritize your marriage, you leave a crack and an orifice for stuff to creep in. Then the wider the crack becomes, the more we start to focus on what we don't like about our mates. The more we take our marriage out of that first position, the easier it is to see, oh my God, he's getting on my nerves. Oh my God, if she said that one more time. Oh my. And you know, now all of a sudden you start noticing all the little things you didn't notice. Mm. You know, why is she doing that? Why? And, 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 and it, what it is, is there's always some things, but when we're looking at things from a positive perspective, when we're looking at the, this is what I need. And the thing is, what you've got to know is when I'm looking at my wife and I'm seeing the things she's not, that's because I'm that. I don't need her to be that. I am. That's what makes a good couple is we don't do this. We do this. Where I'm weak, she's strong. Where she's weak, I'm strong. 
The idea that I'm strong in everything is what will destroy the marriage because I'm not. But I have to put her first to see it. Mm. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question or a thought that you'd like to share? Just hit star six. Anyone? That really spoke to me, quite honestly. So thank you for that. Oh, uh, to Michelle, you are welcome. Michelle Curse uh, said, thank you, you're welcome. Look, uh, there's so much going on in the Black community. Um, and for those who follow me on YouTube at The Black Voice, you'll know that I spend a great deal of time talking about the restoration of the Black family unit. Marion has her channel, Restoring Ghettos Forgotten. Uh, which stems from her book, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. And we're, she deals a lot with women, but she also has some pretty solid and strong uh, advice from men coming from a female perspective. Um, but uh, what you'll find is that you can't search history and see the scorning of marriage and the survival of society. Normally the decline in society and civilization starts with the spurning of the covenant of marriage uh, where it's okay to just sit up and say, you know, this is my woman, uh, this is my boyfriend, uh, you know, this is my girl and never really true any commitment to it because the commitment is what anchors you and settles you because they're always go going, you stop having options once you make a covenant. And as long as you've got options, your commitment to dealing with the tough things that come in marriage won't be solidified because you have options. That's what covenant, covenant erases the options. It's me and you, it's it. There's nobody else, just me and you. That's what covenant says. It takes away the options because options will have you spew. And one, and I'll say this and then I'm done. One of the things I wrote in When Your House Is Not a Home, there's an entire section on dating and I don't believe in it. And everybody goes, well, how in the world do you possibly get to know a person? Well, you get to know a person without dating them. You get to know a person. Matter of fact, I didn't date my wife. The first date me and Marion went on, we were already a couple. We had already committed to being married. Uh, you observe a person that you spend time around. And see, that also helps to take the physical attraction and put it in its proper perspective because it's a bunch of beautiful women out of there, but not all of them are meant for me. So I need to observe. But what I, the, what I pointed out about dating that makes it uh, to me detrimental to covenant is when you're dating, there's no commitment or obligation to the other person. I don't owe you anything. I'm dating you. You have a right to date other people. I have a right to date other people. And so even if we're dating exclusively, we have a right to date because we're just dating. Well, this is what happens. If I'm dating multiple people, I'm, I'm probably dating a, one person who is my movie buddy because they absolutely love movies. I love movies, so that's my movie person. Then I'm dating a person who has this thing for fine cuisine because I like to eat. Then I'm dating a person who likes to go out and have fun. So all the fun stuff and crazy wild and out stuff I do with that person. Then there's this person I love to get intimate with because I love the way they feel, the way they touch. So I got all these different people that feel every need that I have. Now, who knows that there is no person in the world that does all of that? Right? So the moment that I decide to settle down, I immediately start missing some of the stuff I used to have when I was dating. The other part of the dating thing is when you date someone, you're saying, okay, we're not committed. We're just seeing how each other go. We're getting to know one another, right? And so the first date is a filler. It can go good or bad and you still have a second date because, okay, maybe that was, I still want to see because I'm really attracted to this person. I'm going to give them another chance, even if it's a bad first date. If you get past the second date and you choose to go on a third date that says something about that person that really draws you. And if it's something about that person that really draws you, every additional time you spend time with them, you leave a piece of your emotional self with them. Every You can sit up and say, no strings attached all day long. Six months in, there's an attachment. 
here's the problem. At any time, that person could come up and say, you know what, it's been fun. I, I really enjoyed it. It was great, but I'm not feeling it anymore. I'm, I'm good. I'm out. Take care of yourself. Have a wonderful life. And you have absolutely no recourse to hold them to you. Now, I know in this society, that's not that big of a deal because people do that marry now. Irreconcilable differences. But at least you got to go through a certain process of checks and balances. The legal system, you can't file a day and get it today. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to go through. At least it's that. But there are some other things, hopefully, that you think about before you commit to a marriage. You know, you don't just say oh, you want to get married. We married now. No, you got to go through a process with that, too, that gives you time to think, do I want to be connected to this person? And that's some questions we ask, but that dating thing creates the situation where now I'm exploring options. The problem is the more the options that I bring in while I'm exploring them and experience, the more difficult it's going to be to please me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've uh, interviewed people in writing when your house is not home and merging souls. And some of the people who stay together the longest were each other's first, like for instance, my, my daughter and her husband have been married now for 14, going on 15 years. That was her first. And what happens is with that is you don't know what you're missing because you haven't experienced anything else. You have nothing to judge your person by that you're not getting because you don't know. So you build everything from there. So it's just so many different elements that we look at. Uh, finally, be willing to explore. Get away from the mundane. That's my goal this year is to get away from the mundane. Stop being so predictable. What's the best place to buy your book, the, um, When Your House Is Not a Home? Because I don't see it on Amazon. Uh, when Your House Is Not a Home, um, you can go to Barnes and Noble. Barnes. It's only in digital. I'm about to bring it back to print probably sometime summer, but you can get the digital Kindle version. Awesome. Um, on a book. Well, I guess it would be the Nook version, but you can read it on a Kindle too. Okay. Uh, it would be at Barnes and Noble. Just look up When Your House Is Not a Home, Dr. Rick Wallace, and it'll pop up. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Wallace? Uh, can I uh, can I pose a question? Yes, please. Um, thank you. Unfortunately, I joined late. I mean, this is like my best Sunday start, and I was doing so much around the house that I joined late. But I did get to hear a lot of what Dr. Wallace said, and I think those are beautiful thoughts and sentiments about marriage. Um, unfortunately, my marriage ended because the person that I was married to was my chosen stepdad was not accepting of the fact that my kids had challenges. Um, and that's what really tore the marriage apart. He, he was just not accepting of those challenges that they had. And as a result, he undermined them in horrible ways. So if I were to ever again enter into a relationship that leads to marriage, which I very much want, and I think it's very, very possible to have that loving relationship and with someone who accepts my children, although my children are now young adults, one is well, adults, one is 26 and the other is 20. And the 20 year old is the one who has the, the greater challenges and he's the, the boy. And um, so my question for you, Dr. Wallace, is how does one introduce um, and at what point is it appropriate to introduce, hey, here's what I'm dealing with in my family circle to someone who you might find to be, um, you know, someone that you would want to date. And just to let you know, I never introduced my children to anyone, any, anyone. I did not, they didn't see me date anyone when I was single. And I didn't date anyone until I was 10 years out of my divorce. So my ex-husband was the first person they ever met who I then married. So I'm very careful with them, but obviously they were younger then. So I'll be quiet and I'll just let you address this question. But again, thank you for sharing those beautiful sentiments about your own marriage. And I hope that I will have the same at some point in my life. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Thank you. Uh, 
succinctly, there are two elements here. The first one is you introduce the challenges, especially when it comes to your children. You introduce the challenges as soon as possible. Doesn't mean you introduce the kid, but you introduce the challenges. You let a person know, first and foremost, I'm the mother of however many kids you have. And, you know, maybe this is the third, second or third encounter with this person. Because this isn't about presenting your representative. This isn't about presenting the perfect picture. This is about presenting reality. Keep in mind that your time is valuable. So if a person cannot see, and the thing is, you shouldn't have to convince a man to be willing to accept. See, I was taught as a child being reared by my great grandmother that I was told early on, when you meet a woman and she has kids, if you can't love the kid as your own, that's not your woman. She will never be your woman. And I have kids. No one will know which ones out of my kids that aren't mine biologically. I don't call them stepchildren. I don't call them my ex's children. They're mine because I decided to accept them. And, you know, and, and I told somebody not too long ago, I said, man, you know, out of all the reasons why I want this marriage to work, you know, I keep running into situations. I'm grabbing children, you know, and so I have a relationship with children. I no longer have a relationship with their mom, you know, but, and, and so the thing is you want a person to know what's going on with you and your children. It's close to the beginning. It's you don't want to lead with it, but you don't want to be a month off into a situation and they don't know it's there because that's a month wasted if they can't deal with it. And the right person will not only be able to accept it, they will become influential in helping the kid deal with it, especially with that, ch the child with, as you said, with the most challenges being a male. There needs to be a male influence. And if the person can't do that, then that's not the person. It's that simple. Thank you for that. Um, is there any, we're almost out of time. This has been super helpful. I know for me, for sure. Um, okay, we have a comment in the chat I'd like to share. Yes, please. I'm going to read it. It says, this is to you, Dr. Wallace. Maybe the speaker can give some insight. They've been married for 24 years, dated four before that. Uh, their daughter is 20 now, but mental health and marijuana issues keep their family stretched and stressed. And so they just want to get some insight and feedback about how to best deal with that. Okay, uh, this is the one of the hardest parts, especially for mothers. Uh, Remember I talked about the importance of prioritizing marriage. And one of the hardest things for parents to do is see themselves outside of the parenting role. So they tend to put that as the number one priority. And I tell you all the problem is the average kid is gonna grow up and go do their own thing. And you're gonna be left trying to figure out who you are because you invested your whole identity into being a parent. A parent is a transitional uh responsibility you're hopefully training a child and getting a child prepared to go so when you're talking about the strain that they can put on a marriage the marriage has to be again be first number one is what that what that does too is it sends a sign of a united front uh united front to the child that the games that children that normally have issues with some form of addiction they run games they normally play parents against one another because there's always the parent that's going to be more soft uh more inclined to the BS that's gonna be run. And the other parent is probably gonna be the disciplinary and the hardcore enough is enough. And it creates a conflict. You have to have your marriage prioritized above everything. You have to sit down and talk about it. You have to come to a medium. You can't address the child without understanding where you stand first, because the child is becoming an expert at seeing the division and knowing how to play it. You can't help the child until you are solid yourself. So you have to look at who you are, where you're at, where you, what's going on, and you have to realize, again, resources are not infinite. So you feed one another first, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, 
and in every area that's needed, then you address the child. And as, if the child is an adult, you have to address the child with some real strict, strong boundaries. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to do as long as. And you have to follow through on that. That's an intervention. That's a process. If, if the child doesn't ever have consequences, the child doesn't ever have consequences. The child will never ever be forced to confront the demons they're fighting. So and doctor, the hardest part for parents is to apply consequences to someone they love and they see the consequences as hurting them. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the, that's where you got to get to. First and foremost, prioritize the marriage. Get on the same page. Know what you're going to say to the kid. Know what you're not going to allow the kid to do. Because the kid's going to go to who they think the weakest link is. And they're going to run the game. And then they're going to leave the parent who they think the weakest link is to fight the battle for them with the other parent. Mm -hmm. well, maybe we shouldn't do that. You know, well, you know, she is blah, blah, blah. Maybe... There you are making excuses for someone who last thing they need is excuses. Right. So you've got to come together and be a unit. Makes sense. Angela, is there one more comment? I know we're out of time. Yes, I know we're at the top of the hour. I think this one is important. It's a continuation of the same uh, question. And this comment addresses, you know, when you're trying to do that and you keep going down a rabbit hole and you're just having challenges uh, communicating with one another. Uh, how do you, or what do you recommend on how the couple can better communicate? Every time this person is trying to address the situation, she and her husband seem to be going down this rabbit hole and it's very challenging for them. So okay. do you have any recommendations on how they can you know, get better aligned? What, what they're going to need to, anytime that there's issues with communicating and getting on the same page, I recommend mediation, uh, some form of counseling, uh, because what you don't realize is you are traveling that road of addiction or troubled uh, decision making or whatever it is that child is doing. You're traveling that road with them. They're a part of you. Uh, your love for them takes you on their journey and it will create all kinds of barriers and, you know, disruptions in the marriage you need to have a mediator who can sit in and calm things because we communicate through our emotions a lot of times and when someone isn't hearing what you're saying or you perceive that they're not hearing what you're saying then it begins it becomes more emotional and now it's not even about what it was really about at first it's about you're not listening to me and you don't care. And it even is, it's not even about your marriage initially, but it becomes about your marriage. So you have to understand when you need help. It's okay to need help. It's okay to say, you know what? We can't do this on our own. We need to find someone that we can talk to that can provide a stable, safe place for us to discuss this and maybe even provide some insight on how we need to approach this situation with our child. But when you're going down this rabbit hole and the more you go, the more deeper you get, it's because of the inability to effectively communicate. Oh, so true. This whole morning has spoken to me so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of this incredible uh, wisdom and advice. I really, really, really appreciate it. And uh, just want to say we, we're so glad you spent an hour of your time with us this morning. I think I know I got a lot out of it, I'm sure all of our callers did and just appreciate you being here, Dr. Wallace, and hope you'll come back at some point as well. I enjoy being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And like we talked about earlier this morning, my goal is to be an impact. And if that's what I accomplished today, I am absolutely ecstatic. Uh, I look forward to the next time you guys invite me and uh, I wish everybody the best. Uh, if you need uh, help, in any of these areas, definitely feel free to reach out to me. You can email me directly at ceo at rickwallacephd.link and we'll take it from there. Uh, so once again, thank you for inviting me.
Thank you so much. And we will close out with a prayer of Kelly by Kelly Chapman. Okay. And I just wanted to thank you. And, and thank you, and uh, Dr. Wallace. I just wanted to confirm: Do you do tele tele seminars or tele medicine, or do you do those types of things? Yeah, all of my work now is done uh, virtually. So I do one-on-one uh, -on -one visual virtual sessions. I do phone sessions. Uh, I have clients as far away as Australia. Uh, okay, so, great. Yeah, so no matter where you're at, uh, we can make it happen. Um, so just reach out. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Lord, we come to you with praise and thanksgiving on this day in February, during the month that many focus on love. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to learn how to grow in love, love for ourselves, love for each other, and love in our households. In some instances, Lord, our families have grown closer as we come together to support our loved ones who suffer from mental illness. In other instances, the family is broken. The love relationship has become a roommate relationship. And God, only you can help heal and restore the love. We know that you said the greatest thing is love. Love never fails. So we come to you to ask that you intervene in our homes and pour out your love to us. And in turn, we can access your demonstration of love to our husbands, our wives, our partners, our children, and ourselves. Your word says, for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we use the crisis in our homes as another reason not to bond with each other for the day, for the night, or for the month. God, give us wisdom so that we have strategies that keep us from running away from love, and that will help to soften our hearts so that we can run to love in our households. Soften our hearts so that we can rekindle the joy of being in each other's presence. During this time of quarantine, give us tactics to employ patience, forgiveness, self-control, and whatever we need to run to our loved ones versus away. In some instances, we know that this will take a supernatural intervention in our lives. We are dug in. We feel as though we are past the point of reconciliation. So we ask for your miracle working power to intercede in our relationships and to restore the love. Help us to see the divine in our spouses, the God in our spouses and partners. Help us to remove the filter of the past and look towards the future through the lens of love. Remind us daily why we loved one another in the first place. Give us this lens of love. Finally, for those of us who are single, give us the patience and ability to love ourselves and be good to ourselves. And God, we ask you to continue to love us and bless us on our journey alone with you. So we thank you, Lord, and we will be careful to honor your name as we walk out this journey, trusting you and your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kelly, so much. Have a beautiful week, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Wallace, again. And we will be back next week. And just to mention, um, we will be bringing uh, Tamiko Ruby J every Sunday for a breakout Reiki session after our call starting next Sunday on Valentine's Day. So we'll have a special additional piece of love and that information will be coming out to each of you this week as well. So thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. And thank you again, Dr. Wallace. And thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Have a good day. Dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.
From conceptual perspective, people talk about it as all of the elements.